many years ago that I first saw a Prophecy Club video that was given to me by a pastor out on the West Coast. I'd been teaching all day on Bible prophecy, about nine hours. I was exhausted, but this pastor came up to me and said, they found Pharaoh's chariots and army strewn for a mile and a half on the bottom of the Red Sea, and we've got it on video. I tried to hide my look of disbelief, and I said, well, do you have a copy? Could you bring it to me? And I said, I've got a copy. He gave it to me. I went home, and at about midnight, after teaching all day long, I put that video in, I watched it, I rewound it, I watched it, I rewound it, I watched it until five o'clock in the morning, and I said, this is the greatest tool I have ever had in my hands in my life. And I thought, why has this not spread like wildfire through the Christian church? I am not an unaware person. I didn't consider myself completely out of the loop. But yet, some of this had been out for years, and I had no idea. Why haven't I heard about it? Well, I realized after about a week, the reason why more people haven't heard about it is because in one week, I only showed it to about five people. And I thought, at this rate, that's why no one hears about it, because if everyone was doing what I was doing, no one would ever get to hear five people in a week. I was traveling up to Two Harbors, Minnesota. When I arrived there, I had a brilliant idea. If this message is going to get out, I am responsible to do it. And so what I did is I plotted out two days in which I went into every single business, every shoe store, every beauty parlor, every insurance agency, every restaurant, in that little village, in Two Harbors, Minnesota, is where 3M, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, was started. It has 4,000 people in the whole surrounding area. It's a small village. In fact, it's so small that if you make a, a, a call and you reach the wrong number, you still know the person that answers the phone. <laughs> it happens all the time. It's that small. And so what I did is I went into every doorway, and as I went into the door, I threw the doors open, and I shouted out just as loud as it took to where everyone in the building could hear me, you'll never guess what they found! And I just froze, just like that. This bearded guy with his hat on. And finally, someone would say, okay, what did they find? They found Pharaoh's chariots and army strewn for a mile and a half on the bottom of the Red Sea, and we've got it on video. I'll never forget this one man. He didn't turn red. He turned purple. He was so filled with rage. He let out the worst cursing I'd heard. He was absolutely furious because I had just wrenched from him every vile and vain excuse he ever had to believe that the Bible is full of fairy tales. Because I'm telling him that right now, in this modern world, we have the video that God did a miracle that cannot be denied. Amen. And he was furious. And I'll never forget when I walked into the bank. The teller at the first window, she stood there frozen for a moment when I said that, and then the tears just started pouring down her face. That's what she wanted to hear her whole life, that the Word of God is real, it's alive. She believed it, but to have evidence right now that it's alive, that it's real, it just, it just went right to her heart. That's the person I'm looking for. Not the guy that goes ballistic with rage, but the person that has a tender heart, that wants a touch of the Holy Spirit in their life. When I saw that, something changed right then. I went over to Superior Shores and I rented their ballroom, which was just in construction, hadn't been used, and they brought in the television from the bar and set it up. That Friday night, I invited everyone. From then on, I went into these buildings and I invited everyone to come out and see. Seventy people from that little community showed up, including several scientists from the National Laboratory of the Environmental Protection Agency in Duluth. 
The next day, on Saturday, this was spreading like wildfire through the entire community. People were so excited about it. They were talking with their friends, their neighbors, their relatives, people that they've never talked to about the Bible before, but all of a sudden it was so real that they were on fire. They were so excited to share. And then Sunday came. And then I found out why this had not spread like wildfire through the Christian church. Because when they went to their Sunday school classes and they went to their churches, those pastors began to throw cold water on it as fast as they possibly could. Because if this did not come through their denomination, it has no validity. They are the paid professionals. If they don't say it, it's not true. Certainly, certainly, if the Almighty is going to do anything as magnanimous as in this day and time is to reveal the chariots and army of Pharaoh on the bottom of the Red Sea, certainly he will do it through the Episcopalian Church. <laughs> or the Lutherans, or the Baptists, or the Assembly of God, or whatever denomination you happen to have, certainly it's going to happen through them. And if it doesn't come through us, then it is worthless. And in one day, those professional religious leaders killed the work of the Holy Spirit, and by Monday, it was dead. It was a very important lesson, but a lesson that had to be learned because the system doesn't need to be and doesn't want to be woken up. The system works. If you just come in, sit down, shut up, pay your 10% religion tax, which is authorized by the 501c3, tax-exempt non-corporations doing business as the modern Christian church under the Internal Revenue Service Code. And if you start asking questions, if you start asking questions, you will find out that the system doesn't need you. It needs you to shut up. In the next week, I am bombarded with anti-Ron Wyatt literature that these professional preachers are getting off the internet. And I end up with the world's largest privately held collection of anti-Ron Wyatt literature. I go through and I read it all, and I decide that I have got to hear it directly from the person. And so while I was up there in Minnesota, I sold the last of my worldly treasures because it was going to take that to make this trip. And after a meeting with uh, Henry Groover one weekend, I knew then that I needed to go see Ron Wyatt. Because Henry Groover during that weekend told a story that was so compelling that I knew then I had to see Ron. I called him up and I said, Ron, I would like to come down and spend a week with you and talk to you about the Ark of the Covenant and some other issues. And I could hear his hesitation on the other line. And he said, well, have you seen the videos? Uh, do you have any specific questions? And I'd only spoken to him once before at that point, And he didn't know me at all. And so I stopped at that moment because, you know, I know he's thinking, who is this person? Come down and spend a week with me? Like, right. And, and so I said, Ron, I believe that if you'll pray, the Lord will tell you whether I'm supposed to come down or not. He said, okay, call me back in three days. I called him back in three days, and he said, come on down. So I made the trip down, and on the way, I sold the last of my worldly treasures. And when I did so, I said, Lord, there's only one thing I want. I am giving up these things that I've had for years, that I've, some of them I've worked. I've, well, you know, I've searched for this one thing uh, uh, for 35 years, and uh, now that I have it, I'm selling it because I have to make this trip, and there's only one thing I want. I want to know if Ron Wyatt is a liar or if he tells the truth. And I want him to be exposed for who he truly is. That's what I'm asking for. Because what I saw that was posted on the Internet was very disturbing. I went down there and spent a week working with them on the museum just before it was built. And at the end of that period of time, the last night in his home after dinner, the things that he shared with me, then I knew there was one thing that I had to share with him. And when I did, the lights went on 
And he gave me the confirmation, and when I walked out of there, I knew that he was telling the truth. I knew that he had found the Ark of the Covenant, and it was not a light thing. I knew that he had found the Red Sea crossing site. This is not fiction. And then I went back and reread all that anti-Ron Wyatt literature, and I found that this is all coming from people who did not have any firsthand information. According to the scriptures, they are false witnesses. If you go into a court of law and you testify about something that you've heard, but you have not been a firsthand witness, you will be in bracelets, let out, and thrown in the slammer. The Torah is not so kind. It says, those who have borne false witness, you bring them before the elders, and they are to make diligent inquiry. And if they have found that this person is borne false witness, that they have said something about someone else, which will do harm to them, which they do not have firsthand information, then it is eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, cut their head off. That's the only way you are going to stop these liars. Because you never know what evil lurks in the heart of man and what envy and what venom comes out for what reason. You have no idea the wickedness in the heart of man. And when you find them to be a false witness, if it would have cost the other person their life, it's over with. So I became a first-hand witness. And then I began to go to the land of Israel. I went to these places. I went to the city of Gomorrah. I have the world's largest privately held collection of brimstone that rained down out of heaven nearly 4,000 years ago because I followed the same path that Ron Wyatt did when he found it. Now you go to Israel on a regular tour. The coaches will pull off to the side of the road. They'll point out to the remains of Gomorrah. They'll talk about it. Of course, you know, they can't set up any fruit stands out there or tourist traps. So, you know, in that 120 degree desert. So you'll never go out there unless you go on our tour. And we will be out there at 3 o'clock in the morning. We wake up. We get out there and make a pre-dawn trek into Gomorrah. And you will be collecting brimstone yourself. If you take the time to light a match to that, it'll immediately turn into a black oozing mass with purple flames. It still today will melt stainless steel. And as the Torah says, nothing remains of the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Admon, and Zeboim except for brimstone, salt, and ashes. And nothing grows there. And it's still that very way to this very day. 